as everybody knows, this is an unusual AOC this year because we've had to move it to be completely virtual. Normally at this time of year, we'd be meeting together, we'd be sat around tables and we'd be discussing. Um, this year, as obviously as everybody knows, is different and we haven't got the opportunity to do that. However, because we have the opportunity to move to a virtual platform, we have got a greater opportunity to speak to more people. Um, and I'm really pleased that this session has been booked by over 200 people and I'm watching the, the participant numbers click up now. So I hope that we've got an evening tonight of, of really good debate, um, good questions, and people can come away from this session feeling that they've got some value and they've learned something that they didn't know previously. In preparation for this, I was reflecting back to the NOC of last year and what we spoke about. And we, we spent the, the, the whole day and a half really talking about the future, talking about what it is we wanted to do, um, the types of things we were gonna become involved in. And I don't think at that point, anybody could possibly have predicted the 2020 that we've had. Um, it would have been completely impossible. Even in November, um, COVID wasn't being spoken about at all. I don't think it existed. Um, so what's happened in this year is completely unprecedented um, and certainly beyond the experience of just about anybody that I can think of. And I think it's really important as we start these sessions to really reflect on this and for each and every one of you that's, that's listening here to to really take pride in what we've managed to do this year. Um, we collectively, um, driven entirely by you in the, in the practices, we've been able to maintain services and we've been able to maintain the services for our patients. And we've been able to begin the recovery process in a really positive way. And that's something that we were obviously going to talk about tonight as we as we start to talk about the the outpatient restoration and transformation program but I think it's also important that we reflect that that's come at some cost both personally and professionally and I don't think there's anybody anywhere who won't have been affected or know somebody that's been affected by by the pandemic and we we do we need to acknowledge that and recognize the the stresses and the pressures that everybody has been working under and as i said to pay tribute to each and every person here for being able to maintain those services in in a really really stressful and unprecedented time so again moving back to 2019 one of the things we did talk about um, was the outpatient transformation project and what we thought the outpatient transformation project was going to be and what we thought it was likely to deliver. And I think largely speaking, a lot of what we talked about is still completely relevant today and is certainly even more relevant as we move forward over the next, the next couple of years. Um, I think we need to understand what it is and we need to recognize that it's no longer the outpatient transformation project. It's now the outpatient restoration and transformation project. And as far as tonight's session, that is what we're here to discuss. So the way we're going to structure tonight is um, I'm really pleased that we've got um, Karis Stacey, who's the patient pathway redesign lead for ophthalmology and eye care transformation and Claire Roberts, who's the National Clinical Lead for Optometry within the project. Both job titles just roll off the tongue. Um, but they are here and they are going to be able to present to us what the programme is and, and really what its, what its aims are. Then halfway through, what we're going to do is stop and we're going to have a panel discussion with members of the steering group. Um, and that is your opportunity to ask questions and to debate any issues that come up you have now or come up during the session. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's the Q&A function, which allows you to pose questions. And that will then enable me to pose those questions in turn to the panel. And then what we'll then do is round up with a final presentation talking much more about the future and where the aspiration for the project lies. So I think without further ado, um, I will hand over to Karis 
who can take us through what the outpatient restoration and transformation project is. So that's Caris and Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Sorry, everybody. I am just going to organise my screen. Can I just check, Liz? Can everybody see that? Yep, that's live. So uh, thank you very much for advising Claire and I. So as uh, Richard uh, mentioned, we are both working in, uh, in the national programme in NHS England. And today we are just going to share with you the work that we've been doing and, and where we are going. So the uh, kit. So you will all know that we've got the national, uh, the NHS long-term plan, and certainly for our patients, there is a sort of passion and a drive and a want to actually be reducing outpatient attendances, uh, and up to a third of those being moved from from face to face. Uh, that in turn will be able to release sort of expenditure. And what we want to do, and it's something that I will share is some data about how we ensure that all patients can access digital outpatient care. So I will introduce it and hand over to Claire halfway through this sort of first part of the session. So the case for reforming very much um, is driving from patients and certainly their feedback through the, the sort of National Patient Association is that patients, you know, it's inconvenient to attend and, and we need to provide a different service to them and, and rethink through about the models of care that we, we deliver, the how as well as the what. So this graph just shares some sets out some of that case for increased referrals and I'm sure you will have seen that in primary care too, that, that year on year increase um, has been sort of uh, increasing and that is above and beyond and expected to increase exponentially, particularly where we are looking at comorbidities and uh, an ageing population. But we know that for clinicians, and um, this is some experience of doctors, but I'm sure it is sort of replicated across, you know, all uh, professional groups, that actually, you know, all patients don't need to come. And if we're being really honest, we bring patients back when, when they don't need to be seen. Um, we know, therefore, that that creates inefficiencies and actually people that finish and, and end work late. And we want to be able to create a much better work environment and a work-life balance of working within and delivering health services. And we know that certainly for follow-up patients, they don't need to come for that face-to-face. -face, and how do we provide services differently? So this really has created that case for change about how do we reform? And that is very much a strong word about how and what do we do things differently? So this is some of just wider context that we know the amount of time it takes for people to drive um, or to go on public transport to go for a hospital appointment. And that hospital appointment might be a very short amount of time and disproportionate to the time that, that they've actually taken out from work or from home or from caring responsibilities. We know that actually virtual consultations have a much better impact on uh, the carbon dioxide kind of impact and, and the NHS is committed to really being as one of the largest employers in Europe to really drive forward what and how that they deliver on that agenda. And we know that some of that sort of paper uh, savings and sort of reducing carbon dioxide just has a, an impact on, on the platform, on, on the planet. So for us, we know that there are some bigger gains that we can be making, not just for our patients, but actually for the wider economy. And I think this is a really uh, sort of important as we sort of sit within the context of COVID of about what and how do we enable patients and sort of staff to remain safe. Uh, but to be also be able to kind of offer how do we improve the health economics of the country and, and not sort of bringing patients out for kind of long days and then only be able to see face to face for a short time. We can actually enable people to be more in employment than out needing to kind of come for sort of hospital appointments. So this is a sort of fairly simple infographic. Um, I, I think the slides will be shared afterwards, but it's a sort of normal pathway of how do patients get through the elective patient pathway when, when it was all mapped. Um, and certainly this bit about sort of this self-referral and uh, thinking through about how we can enable people to take their self-care um, is probably things that you have been thinking about in your sort of own practice um, for kind of uh, the people that, and the patients that you see. 
So the National uh, Outpatient Transformation Program um, is a four-year program in the first instance, and that's because the way that the long-term plan has been implemented is that Treasury committed to five years of funding, and then there will be a sort of review point, and then there will be the last five years. So as whole NHS um, ICSs uh, before COVID were asked to produce uh, their five-year plans um, and those were submitted sort of last year and so this program started in April this year and we are running to that sort of end of first treasuries funding and then the program will continue but in the first year we're looking at it as a four-year program. Very much senior buy-in, so um, our programme director meets with Amanda Pritchard, who is the um, Chief Operating Officer and uh, Chief Exec of NHS Improvement, uh, and very much there is senior buy-in that we have that we want to leverage and to ensure that actually we can drive system change. So we know that there are specific interventions, and so we have some of our program is looking at that. Um, and what we're doing in a specialty redesign team is looking at end-to-end -end pathway redesign. So we have a national structure, um, but we also have a regional team, and we work with integrated care systems and uh, STPs, and, and then through to the system uh, to local providers and, and then to local commissioners. So it is very much sort of working at all different levels in the system. Um, within NHS England and NHS Improvement, we are part of the System Improvement Directorate, and that allows us to be able to ensure that we are aligning uh, some of that improvement work that is happening. And I will share some examples of how and what we are doing very much in a live environment now. So this sort of infographic here just kind of sets out. So we have four other work streams that we sit alongside of the national programme. So we have a team uh, who are leading technology enabled improvement and I will share some data but with COVID they have led to the implementation of Attend Anywhere uh, across nationally and I've got some data to share about sort of kind of the achievements that have been made for the NHS uh, since COVID because that's allowed an acceleration and certainly about taking up remote consultations. We've got a team who are leading implementation of personalised follow-up and they have been focusing in on implementing patient initiated follow up. And again, I will share some information and Claire will share some information about work that they are doing now. We have a team who is looking at referral optimization and demand management. And that is very much looking at that referrals in and working with primary care. And, and then we have a sort of more generic team who is looking at the operational side of delivering out patients and then looking at how we can ensure that as a programme, we have got clear roles uh, sort of with the regions and actually our lines of communication are sort of set out. So um, that's the fourth uh, work stream. And then specialty redesign, we are the fifth work stream and we sort of sit and cover and encompass um, because part of it's about how we take all of those elements and think about it at a specialty level. So um, I think the key two sort of points to share with you of what we are trying to do um, through the National Outpatients Transformation Programme is to really enable and support local systems. And the second session tonight that Claire and I are going to take you through is really thinking about all of us as leaders. How do we leverage the, our leadership and um, the place of where we are and, and how and what to enable that to, to be effective to, to deliver change? So certainly we are looking at wanting to do sort of radical change, but actually it's also some of the smaller incremental and it's about how those kind of join up together to actually create some discourse and to be able to move things forward. So it's not always about the big bang. Sometimes it's about the smaller changes that then enable people to do things differently. We know that we really want to think about integration. And again, that will be a word that we will use throughout. Um, but we want to create safe and sustainable ways of working. Um, and I think, again, through COVID, that's even been more apparent about how do we care for our staff? And certainly through the people plan, that's very much a national vision around, you know, we are 1.3 million people who work in the NHS. How do we enable and support each other? But I think through COVID, there's been an urgent imperative to restore services. So certainly coming through to sort of this uh, sort of second wave of COVID, um, there's been uh, sort of it's it's a very different sort of makeup of what was the first. The first was a very steep curve, kind of two way peak and then a sort of drop. 
and very much looking at the national data. And yesterday we were on all staff briefing, Simon Stevens, it's very clear in Keith Willett, who is the national response director for, uh, for sort of uh, resilience for NHS, um, is that this is going to be much more of a slower, longer climb and a far more plateau of sort of kind of a long and then there will be a long tail. So if we had to think about them as mountain ranges, they are very different. It's not a strong peak. It's much more like the Table Mountain in South Africa. It's what really is the sort of view of what and how the NHS is going to have to respond in its kind of in processes for now for kind of much more of a longer duration than, than the wave one. So the things that we are trying to change and implement now are very much going to be the sort of basis for us to be able to kind of take forward transformation. Um, but we really have to focus in about how and what can we do now. And again, Claire and I are going to share kind of that work. And that is a very deliberate focus. Um, and somebody shared yesterday an image of sort of walking through fog and we don't know what the future is going to hold for us as health service uh, clinicians and, and managers, but also for us as, as a country and for us as a world. So I think for us, we really want to make sure that what we're doing is focusing on what we're doing now. The future will come and what that transformation point but we will discover more things as we go through COVID-2 and how we and as part of our restoration. Um, and we want to be able to make sure that we capitalize and focus on the now so that we can actually try and exploit the levers that we do have in place. So the case for reforming is that we are doing a number of things and I will share some data, but we are definitely offering more telephone and video consultations, um, empowering patients through patient uh, to follow up, to uh, book their own follow up appointments and, and enabling uh, sort of clinicians to be able to kind of think about where else they can be uh, seeing patients and then streamlining pathways. So the national focus for us up until for this year is very much about how do we improve advice and guidance? How do we deliver uh, consultations that are sort of remote um, and using other technology and then patient initiated follow up? So this is national data that has come out of uh, setting up a tender anywhere. And you can clearly see that um, before COVID, there was a little bit of interest and we had to pilot work that was going on uh, to implement uh, remote consultations through video. Um, and we can start to see with COVID how that just exploded. But you can start to see that that is tailing back off. So we know that in wave two, that that will probably go up a bit. But you can clearly see here on these sort of grey lines um, that actually over half the patients that we see are not done on a video. So although there has been a huge explosion of capability, of people's experience, um, patients' experience of using uh, remote consultations and using telephone or video, there is a long way to go for us to enable that, to us to deliver a digital first as the first offer to patients. Um, but even through the work that we have done, um, that there's been 8.4 million people who have avoided needing to travel because actually they had their appointment either over the telephone or through, through a video consultation. We know that that has delivered significant uh, reductions in emissions and uh, we know that that has also reduced uh, patient journeys and somebody's done a nice calculation that that's um, the amount of miles is equivalent to flying around the world 5,500 times. So um, I think it's just to make it real about actually we have sort of some of the sort of wider benefits of, of the work that we have done. But we can clearly see on this graph that um, if you were looking at that, you'd be thinking, well, how do we increase and sort of make that line much higher? So that is certainly work that we are taking forward through our technology enabled work stream. So this is just a, an example, but um, Ashford and St. Peter's um, did some work about uh, sort of uh, really trying to move to video consultations. Um, and they were part of one of the pilots, so they were looking at MSK. And so they were starting off with five video consultations a week. And with COVID, that sort of exploded to over 300. And what that means is that you're going to be able to get far more patient uh, feedback, but you're also going to be able to get staff feedback, which means that you're probably going to see the issues that you've got that you need to resolve in how you make sustained change 
much quicker because you're going to get more people feeding back and that's really what you want uh, to be able to kind of identify what the issues are to be able to then resolve them to be able to then put in better processes and to make it much better for, for patients who are attending but as well as the staff um, but there has definitely been some crude ex experience that we've measured uh, around patients experience but also then staff so um, good results and things that we need to build on and uh, we are continuing to do that work because this last year it's been uh, commissioned nationally and now local commissioning of the of a sort of the video consultation platforms is kind sort of now being taken forward at a much more local level and some of you may be involved and aware of some of that work so the other person piece of work that we've been doing is about how we personalize follow-up and again uh, what we have done is set up a rapid adopter project uh, so we are working with 22 nhs trusts um, and what we've asked them to do is implement patient initiated follow-up at scale um, across at least five specialties and what we will be able to do is to gather evidence and to gather examples and case studies of what worked what hasn't worked and how do we then use that to inform national guidance but as well as then implementation support to be able to uh, stop booking appointments follow up appointments where you don't need and patient initiated is where actually the patient can decide when they want to come and it's at that point of their need that they then call up um, so there was sort of lots of work but it's definitely one thing that we think will improve sort of the availability of appointments because actually we're not going to be having follow-up appointments where we don't need them so it's uh, sort of nationally is one of the things that they have been pushing alongside uh, video consultations so um, in our outpatient uh, in the specialty redesign team uh, we are taking much more of a sort of cross program rather than looking at specific interventions um, and, and these are just uh, the most of the areas that we're working in so we're doing some work in ophthalmology dermatology and msk um, and then we are doing work in clinical uh, in surgical specialties as well as in medical and what I'm going to do is I am going to hand over to Claire Roberts, who's going to introduce herself. So um, she is one of three national uh, clinical leads. So they have a sort of joint roles across. And she's going to share with you the work that we've been doing in ophthalmology. And Claire, because I'm going to just manage your slides, I will turn off my camera okay, and you, um, hand over to you. Thank you. So if I could have the next slide, please, Karis. So, um, so Karis has given an overview of the wider programme that this uh, sits within, um, but obviously what we're uh, talking about really coming to share with you tonight is around the work we're doing around ophthalmology uh, and eye care. So, so this is the eye care restoration and transformation project. Um, obviously our context is, is COVID restoration, but that is where we're very focused at the moment. So on our infographic here on the left hand side, we're in COVID restoration. Where we, where we will be headed towards it is, is the wider transformation, but very much at the moment we are quite rightly focused on, on restoration. So we have been doing a work on pathway redesign, so looking at end-to-end -end pathway redesign. We are aware that there are some a very deep work that we need to do to try and unblock some of the challenges around digital transformation and commissioning transformation. Um, in the space we're in at the moment, we're very much looking at system implementation, working with our local systems, uh, doing uh, working with shared learning, looking at where we can share across systems and how we can evaluate some of the work that we're doing. So if I can have the next slide, please. So in terms of, of our team, so you've already met Karis, um, who, who's leading this programme on ophthalmology. And then there's myself, um, obviously an optometrist, and my two other clinical colleagues, Guy Mole and Melanie Hingarini, who are both ophthalmologists. So we share the role as joint clinical leads for the programme. And we are also have Emma Munro and James Young, who are both um, redesign managers. And uh, so, so, we're, so you'll see various ones of us popping up at different points as we're doing work. So can I have the next slide, please? So um, this work on ophthalmology hasn't, hasn't come from, from, from nowhere. Um, we're building on some of the other national work that, that you'll be aware of. 
I said, is the work, the GIFT work, the Getting It Right First Time program, um, the, the big piece of work on ophthalmology. There was the Elective Care Transformation program um, and the EyesWise project. Uh, so many of you will have been aware of, of lots of those other pieces of work. So, so our program now is very much building on the work that's already been happening. Next slide, please. So we know there are some really significant challenges um, around uh, you know, different care models, uh, different levels of governance, system governance, IT solutions, commissioning and payment systems, workforce and training, and challenges around data. So these are all, these are all real challenges that as we look ahead and look at transformation um, and, and, and really unpicking some of these, but this is part of that wider piece of work. Karis has talked about this being a longer program. Uh, where we're focusing right now is the COVID restoration. And what we'll be sharing um, now is some of the work that we've been doing over the over the last six months um, so that we can be working with systems to try and help them um, res restore. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the really important elements of, of, of this uh, programme has been the partnership working. Um, so we have are, are really grateful for the, the, the key stakeholders who have uh, who are working with us on this. So LOXU, College of Optometrists, the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, RNIB, the Clinical Council, GERFT, NHSX. Um, you know, this really has been a collaborate, a collaborative, um, a collaborative piece, and and really important to to have been bringing bringing these key stakeholders together for to sort of bring that consensus and that 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 shared perspective and shared shared voice so there has been such a lot of rapid work that has happened behind the scenes um you know and and I'm, so many colleagues within these organizations have worked tirelessly um and you know and, and often behind the scenes and not necessarily noticed but but it, we're really grateful for that for the work that that has been done next slide please karis so we know we have a call to action that ophthalmology is the largest outpatient speciality, staggering 7.8 million outpatient appointments a year. And your ophthalmology is 10% of all outpatient appointments and 98% of them are face to face. So we know that we are going to have to do things differently. We know that we have a lot at stake. You know, this is about sight loss. This is about reducing harm, reducing avoidable sight loss. How can we do this differently? How can we release some of those outpatient appointments so that we can get our patients seen on time? Next slide, please. So, what we have um, what we have developed is an eye care restoration roadmap, which is designed to. It's really giving a message out to our systems, a a, a consistent message around what systems can do right now to try and support uh, restoration of eye care services. So um, what's really interesting, we've got lots of different systems uh, at different places um, and, and lots of work, that, lots of good work that has gone on across different systems. What we've tried to do here is bring it together, bring it together with a, with a clinical consensus to set out, this is what we can do and these are, these are our opportunities. So, so the opportunities around integrated care pathways, risk stratification, introducing remote consultations where they're appropriate, using diagnostic clinics and, uh, and, and implementing patient initiated follow-up. And so what we will find is different systems are at different places and we have lots of good examples, but this is about trying to bring people on and about, about scaling up change. So in terms of principles, there are principles behind this really key principle around working collaboratively. And I know that for, for you as, as, as LAC colleagues, that is something that, that, it, that, that you um, are, are, are so instrumental in at, at at local level at, at working across the systems uh, but this is about bringing people together having those conversations really starting to, to sh sort of own and share the problem locally um, you, using the existing levers that we have the existing commissioning levers enabling uh, in, in, increasing the digital enablers 
and really working with patients to to help to give them more control and choice. So the roadmap um, is is designed and it's been it's been released out to systems through our regional um, regional colleagues. So if I could have the next slide, please. So in terms of the principles around restoring eye care services, um, all of these will be so familiar because they're, 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 they're elements that, that we've been working with um, for some time. So it's around optimizing our primary care optometry workforce and, and really, really gaining the best out of that. Um, referral filtering, so that we can reduce the number of referrals going in at the front end, better use of advice and guidance where we can, and, and using risk stratification to clinically prioritize patients using those digital enablers and, and scaling those so that we can monitor and manage lower risk patients in the community and really work collectively, collectively together across our systems to provide the best care for patients. Next slide, please. So uh, we have, as part of that roadmap, part of that journey, um, working to, we've, we've developed five uh, pathways, five nationally agreed pathways for cataract, medical retina and glaucoma. Um, huge pieces of work that have gone underneath that, developing a national specification um, and, and protocols to support local systems. So these are designed to work alongside the, um, the COVID, uh, the, the Q's pathway, the COVID-19 urgent eye service pathway, um, but very much about bringing together what is already good practice. So there'll be many of you looking and saying, we're already doing lots of this, but there's so much variation across the country. This was about the value of bringing it together and having that shared perspective and that shared that that um, clinical consensus. So next slide, please. So the five pathways, which you won't be able to read any of that, um, uh, which you know we'll share with you for those of you who haven't seen them, how to how to access those. Uh, but but the five pathways, um, we we held a number of webinars um, to get feedback. We worked with our uh, national stakeholders. Uh, so thank you to many of you who would have been on those, those, uh, those webinars, um, really helpful. And, and, and thank you to the, the panel who you will um, see later on uh, as part of the session, uh, colleagues in the panel who I know really did work particularly hard to, to, to give us feedback and work with us on these. Um, these pathways are, published on our eye care hub right now which I'll share the link to that um, later but these are in going through the NHS England and improvement process for publication so um, at, so, so right now um, they're going through that process so uh, where they will be signed off by Simon Stevens as a fi formal a final formal sign off before they're formally published um, so so this was a, a really huge achievement to get to get that clinical consensus um, because there's huge power when we can stand behind them collectively as national organizations and say collectively this is what we are this is what we want to say to systems so very much they are not prescriptive pathways saying you must do this or you must do that they're about collecting together good practice and and very much um, about being able to start conversations in local systems to actually look at what, you know, what are you doing in your local system for cataract care, glaucoma care or, or, or uh, medical retina care. So that there will be some systems who will look at these and say, do you know, we're doing something even better than this. And that is, that is fabulous. This is, about, this is about enabling systems to look at what they're doing, um, think about different ways of delivering care, and come to that collective uh, collective approach to, to to what needs to be done. And then for some systems, they're really not doing any of this very much at all, and um, and, and very little primary care um, element in the pathways. And so this is to try and make things sim simpler, and and provide something so that we're giving it a shared message, uh, you know, right across the systems. So next slide, please. So just in terms of the, the messaging that we are giving to the systems through the roadmap, 
through those pathways, the opportunities around cataract, around reducing referrals going in by making better use of optometrists at the front end, and also making better use of optometrists to deliver post-op cataract care where that's appropriate. Next slide, please. And again, for glaucoma, at the front end about referral filtering that, that can reduce the um, referrals that don't need to go in by, by, by additional tests in advance. And, and also same again at that, that, that later end in the pathway, using, the, um, using technology for sort of diagnostic data collection, thinking about diagnostic hubs, and just again, using the resources that we have to, 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 to increase capacity and reduce what's going into the hospital. And next slide, please, Karis. And again, medical retina, again, really similar. It's about what can we do before referral to make better use of, uh, of community optometry and technology. And then once patients are needing ongoing treatment, which, what can we, bring out into the community. Next slide, please. So also within the roadmap, um, it, it's not just about the pathways, it's about, it's about using other elements like remote clinics, as Karis has already talked about some of that in a, in a more, in a wider context, but we've, you know, we've got examples of where this is being used um, effectively for, for ophthalmology to reduce the need for patients coming in for face-to-face -face appointments and of particular importance where, where, the, where there's been risk of uh, COVID transmission. So next slide, please. And diagnostic clinics, again, making, making use of technology so that um, patients don't have to go into the hospital if diagnostic tests can be done elsewhere and, and just reviewed separately. Again, reducing, reducing risk of COVID transmission and going into hospitals and, and being more efficient. Next slide, please. So Karis has mentioned patient-initiated follow-up with a a wonderful um, acronym, PIFU. Um, and so you know, this is one of those examples that, you know, on a first look, um, there are lots of other specialities where PIFU is, it, it sort of seems more logical than ophthalmology, but actually because we've, we, we've been looking at it because um, th there are more examples where this is being used, um, we're learning all the time, where can this be used? Where is the value? So there are some of the sort of wider work around rapid adopters for PIFU, where they're doing it across a number of specialities. There are There is some work within that that's going on around ophthalmology. So we're expecting there's gonna be some great case studies that will come out of that, lots of learning. And, and again, it's just being more efficient where we can, where it's useful. So it's about learning from that work and, and, and being able to, to share that where it's important. Thank you, next slide. So in terms of implementing the roadmap, there, there are benefits right across the system, benefits for patients, um, reducing face-to-face -face contact, um, making, making it easier for accessing care, community and primary care, you know, benefits for the system through collaborative working, improved clinical relationships, and just working as a system and thinking differently, improving referrals, you know, obviously operationally performance improving, and, and better quality of care when we're, when we're reducing the duplication. So on all sorts of levels, there are gonna be lots of different things that different systems can be working on and implementing, but, but benefits all round. Thanks, Karis. Next slide. So um, we have an eye care hub, and uh, we'll obviously the the, link, the uh, slides will be shared afterwards. But it's a really really great resource. That's where these pathways, the uh, roadmap, all of the documentation is stored on the hub, so that there's there's a sort of single place where where these can be accessed. Uh, but there's huge amounts of um, huge amounts of information again just really trying to make it as simple as possible so that if if you know we're aware that um that, you know, that there is not a lot of capacity 
necessarily to to keep reinventing the wheel um, and so if we can produce some of this and really support people to to be able to just access it simply then if, if we can make it simpler then then things are more likely to happen so um you'll see on the right hand side it's got um the link onto the eye care hub it is something that you have to um that you have to join so you can request access once you've got the access it, it's really simple and so so the idea is that you can access this your commissioners can access this other colleagues other commissioning colleagues can access this and so it's something where you've got a shared resource that you can use so that's very much about the work that we've been doing now i'm going to hand back to richard so thank you Thank you, Claire, and, and, and thank you, Karis. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to move to the second part of this evening's session, which is to have a discussion panel with both Claire and Karis, but also members of the steering group, um, representative members from, from primary care of the steering group. Um, and this is an opportunity here. I know some people have already posed questions in the, in the chat box, and I will pose as many of those as I can. But if there's any other questions, do slot them in there and we will now try to discuss those as we move. So to start with, I would like to introduce Sarah Kant. Thanks, Richard. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sarah Kant. I'm the Director of Policy and Strategy at the College of Optometrists. And I sit on the um, Eye Care Restoration and Transformation Steering Group alongside uh, Colin Davidson, who's the President of the College, and Daniel Hardiman McCartney, who's one of our clinical advisors. I'm now going to hand over to Zoe to introduce herself. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm Zoe Richmond. I'm an optometrist and I also sit on the steering group. Um, so I'm the clinical director for LOCSU, and uh, that's the LO LOC support unit. And um, through my voice on the steering group, I bring together the collective voice of our parent organizations, the AOP, FODO and ABDO, but also the representative voice of all the LOCs across England. And I want to hand over to Peter. Thanks, Zoe. So um, I'm Peter Hampson and I'm clinical director of the Association of Optometrists in my sort of main role nowadays, but I'm also an optometrist in independent practice. And it's in that role that I sit on the steering group representing smaller practices and smaller providers. And I'll hand over to, uh, to Giles Edmonds now. Thank you, Peter. I clearly missed the brief about the background. So um, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm an optometrist, uh, practice owner in Sutton Coalfield. Um, I'm uh, the clinical director of Specsavers and um, in this capacity I'm representing large community providers. Thank you everybody. So um, we've had a number of questions come in about um, involvement actually and how individuals can get involved. So in the first instance a question to both Karis and to Claire. Um, we've got members of the steering group here. Could you outline what the steering group is and how it operates? I will probably take that one. Thank you, Richard. Um, so the steering group is very much uh, where we can uh, have uh, sort of national uh, voices at the table to help us think through some of the sort of key decisions that we are making about how we can get in consensus from people across the country uh, in the clinical communities in particular about the work that we are doing. So I think that very much uh, has been the, the want and the ask. So certainly that is where uh, all of the people that are on this panel and, and those that aren't that are on the steering group, we have been giving them lots of things that we need them to go and review, to give us feedback, to be able to go and work with their members uh, at different uh, sort of mechanisms Mechanisms to be able to give us some feedback. Certainly when we had the webinars, it was about sort of identifying and sharing uh, some of that through their, their links so that they can actually sort of advertise. But I think for me, the getting involved is really going through the eye care hub because there are forums there that you can set up, you can pose questions, you can be putting uh, discussion points. Uh, and for us, um, I think it is about how we've also enabled the steering group members to be able to sort of really identify some of those resources that we've been developing. Um, because I think for us, it's about having that one place where people can go. Um, and we absolutely, and I would reiterate the the value and the, the background work that certainly some people have done. Um, in particular, I'm, I would call Zoe out around some of that sort of work that was done on the specifications with Peter. Um, and, and so it's very much about sort of they've been doing as much as kind of giving us some advice and some feedback. 
Thank but you. I'm sure others might want to add their own view of what they thought that they have been doing. Well, that was that was going to be my next question to the steering group members. Um, Zoe, do you want to start with that one? How how's it how's it been going for you? Yeah, certainly. Um, thank you. Um, do you know what? And I've, I've said this out loud a number of times. You know, it was like getting on board a moving train. And 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 my first experience, in, you know, I was wondering just how under control the whole the whole thing was. But you know, as we've as we've gone through the process, um, it, 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 it's been it's been a great experience. We have been working at pace. Um, lots of um, demands put on steering group members um, time working in a very flexible way. Um, I think to, be, to begin with, like, like I say, I, I, I joke, but I wasn't entirely um, sure what, this, what the role of the steering group um, was. I think it's, it, it's getting better understood now. I think it's fair to say that um, we, it's, as, as Claire picked up in her part of the presentation, which we've done an awful lot of work about the immediate the restoration and that's where all the pace and flexibility flexible way of working has come and we you know we, we need to move on to that phase two don't we where we we look towards transformation you know there's a risk there's a risk that um, you know people look at these pathways and think well actually we're, we're delivering transformation we're not delivering transformation yet we're we're delivering a so solution for now to really standardize the approach but 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 we've we've now um, got a steering group and, and a program of work that is looking towards transformation I don't know if any of my steering group colleagues would like to add to that Sarah you're nodding so do you want to add anything at all yes because I was just reflecting I mean it, I understand the really rapid um, rate that uh, this program's had to move to, to respond to COVID and, and to make sure that we've got um, a, you know, a clear view on, on pathways and uh, a roadmap that will, will help with restoration. But a, um, I think sometimes there's been that frustration of really wanting to get our teeth into something and, and look at that transformation. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to a focus on transformation now and using all of the skills, all of the knowledge of the steering group and the, the organisation they represent and the, the membership of those organisations who can feed into that and, and get that collective knowledge really shaping these so that they really work best for patients, um, for, for optometrists, for, for other eye healthcare professionals and, and we see the best outcomes from them. Peter and Giles, you've got anything you want to add? Um, I mean I think Zoe and Sarah have covered it quite well but I think at the moment there is a need to move at pace and that's understandable. I think we've got a, still got quite a bit of work to do to get the, the balance of input correct. I don't think we're quite there yet. So I think we've moved in a positive direction, but I think we need, as others have said, um, more of a chance to make sure we get all encompassing views and, and that those views are adequately represented from uh, different parts of the eye care sector and that we're not leaning one way too much rather than another. Giles? Thanks. And um, I think there's a there's broad agreement, isn't there, across the whole of the steering group that something's got to change, um, you know, with um, with with um, pre COVID waiting lists. And, and that's only got worse throughout COVID. Um, you know, clearly there's challenges around um, capacity in the future, aging population. Um, and, um, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's clear we, we, we have to do different. I think there there are very clearly two phases. One is how, how can we fix the short term problem and it therefore Sometimes when you do that means that you take decisions that maybe uh, don't seem quite as obvious as they would do longer term, but it's a stepping stone to maybe the, long, the longer term position. Um, you, know, um, I, you know, we may or may not talk tonight about sort of the IT piece and NHSX and stuff like that. I think, I think we're all clear where we want to get to eventually, and there's probably a journey um, and, uh, and many months and, uh, of work to get there. So um, I think for any of the, um, you know, obviously I, I represent large providers. I think um, I'm just looking down the list as a, as a number of participants from large providers. We, we, I meet with your representative or um, sort of leaders um, of the majority of the large providers every month to make sure that they're involved. But I think if there are any um, large providers participants on tonight that, that have any questions, then by all means, um, you know, I'm here to represent you. So please, please send them across to me or feed them in through your uh, through, through our monthly monthly meeting. And, and I would add to that, actually, I've seen there's one question asking how um, LOCs get involved in this. It's exactly the same process. Um, you have your optical lead team. E each LOC has works with, with the local optical lead. Feed any questions through, and then that can be fed up through to Zoe. And I'm sure, Peter, you can do exactly the same for the, for the, the smaller practices. I think drawing on, on something that 
both Peter and Giles have, 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 have touched on and also drawing together a number of questions. Um, there's, there's clearly a willingness, a real desire for people across the whole of England to get involved in the delivery of the restoration services. But we have some reluctance from commissioners, not, not entirely CCGs, but, but, but commissioners to actually do it. So again, one really, I guess, for, for Caris or, or maybe even for Claire, what can the project do to kind of help move that forward in areas where the, where the CCGs are not so keen to commission the services? If I take that one, uh, Richard. Um, so when Caris and I give the next part of our presentation, we will touch on some of that. Uh, but we're very much working through our regional teams um, and working with local systems to to establish you know, where, where they're at at the moment and how we can support that. So some of that work is around uh, work with, with, with certain local systems and, and, and part of our work is around, around looking at how we can, how we can empower the wider, the wider system. Okay, so, so really it's about you setting a tone for us locally or probably more realistically regionally to go and work with the commissioners to drive that forward. Yes, and and certainly with the roadmap, that's very much about being a, cons a consistent approach, a consistent message that's coming down from the national team, through the regional team, uh, so that it, it so uh, from a consensus place. Okay, so that's obviously Zoe. That's something that we can get involved in through the the forums and the the regional teams. No, Richard. absolutely. We, we need we need we need that um, bottom up approach as well, don't we? And you know we've got all, all everybody that's joined us this evening involved in um, local optical committees and them getting in, involved in their local systems and using the resources that are being published and having those conversations. And certainly through Loxu um, and on, on our optical um, leading, we can come out to LOCs and, and 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 spend some time to explain what this program wants to deliver how they can support it um you know it's not it's it, it, it's not a one-way engagement isn't it we, you know Lux was able to come down and um talk to and, and join meetings with um ICS leads and CCGs as we always have done um, but also then make those connections through our connections through the steering group and through you know our links with um, the likes of Karis and, and Claire and they can and connect everybody together and Giles do you want to come in on that yeah, I think I was just going to, you know, I suppose to, to sort of set expectations, there is, you know, we, it's fair to say that uh, I think majority of steering group members on here have, have, have been um, pushing for central, more, more cent stronger central direction. Um, I, I think there is um, not, not, not a huge desire or ability to do that. I think it's being, it's being uh, open and transparent about it. And therefore, I think we, we absolutely have to, you know, do what Zoe said in terms of, we, we've got to encourage the local systems to adopt it. Um, and, and, you know, clearly that is, that, that is more difficult, slower, um, but, the, but that is, that is the, the, the sort of the, the hand we've been dealt, I suppose. And therefore that's, you know, um, we, we do um, uh, regularly talk about that, you know, can we get more central direction on this if it's the right thing to do? But I think at this moment in time, it's, it's clear it's, it's got to be um, support local systems and therefore, um, you know, do it, do it that way. Shall I finish that sort of round it up, Richard, to take it back to, uh, so it is very much that the roadmap is, um, I think, seen as like one of the sort of spearhead first pieces of work to come out of the National Outpatient Transformation Programme that is about scaled change across England rather than, for example, where we've got patient initiated follow up, sort of smaller rapid uh, adoption uh, sort of pieces of work. And We've been having conversations with regions. Ophthalmology is, you know, on that top list alongside orthopedics um, across the country. There has been a, a number of sort of different ways that regions are wanting to take that forward. So in London, they've done a very much cross piece of work. And, and Claire and I will sort of share a bit wider. Um, I've been doing that with uh, joint with Get It Right First Time. Um, and they have they are doing sort of a significant amount. And there is a workshop tomorrow morning around medical retina of really trying to get consensus across London. Um, that approach is going uh, sort of through with East of England region. Um, so we are again looking at sort of that regional and what and how they can be working through with their ICS and STPs. Um, 
So there is a want, there is a need, um, and it is very much about everybody is aligning together to work about what and how can we sort of really ensure that we are providing the most care that we can to those that need to in that high sort of high risk categories um, while we are sort of just working through kind of that COVID restoration. Um, but I think that, you know, there are things that everybody can be doing. And, and again, we'll come back to that a bit later, but it's, it's not that we need to try and create that appetite. It is there. I think it is now about how we take and implement and really deploy and sort of, uh, sort of at each level about how and what we do of taking that roadmap so that it makes a difference to patients and to the staff that are delivering that care. Okay, so, and also, and again, this is just going to draw in a number of questions that, ca that came in. I'm going to ask this one, to ask Peter to, to talk a bit about this. Um, there was a lot of talk in the roadmap, a lot of talk in the presentation about virtual consultation um, and the use of technology in that consultation. Um, has there been, or do we know of any work that's maybe been undertaken around the effectiveness of virtual consultation and any kind of patient, I mean, it's probably unlikely to be that much patient feedback, but patient feedback around virtual consultation. I don't know if that's something you've picked up at all, Peter. So the sort of feedback so far seems to be that they're, they're generally positively received, but I think it's important that there is the option for face-to-face -face where needed as well. So it can't replace a lot of things that are done in optometric practice because of the nature of what we do. So from anecdotal feedback, largely at the moment, because as you say, it's too early really to have anything detailed, but patients are receptive to it. It does work well for certain conditions. The deflection sort of from keeping appointments free for those with greater need is very important, but there are still challenges around it at the moment. Is, is anybody, um, I mean, I don't know if Giles, if you've come across that in your businesses at all, have you, have you had, had any feedback at all? Yeah, I yeah, would, would agree with Peter. They work um, for certain pathways far better than others, um, you know, and, um, but there are certain limitations, you know, you, you can't do, uh, in some cases, you can't check VAs, you can't do some basic, you know, some basic tests. So um, it, it, I don't know if anyone's seen the, the fascinating video that's came out from, from Moorfields actually, which looks at the, you know, percentage of um, percentage of uh, virtual care that they're doing already actually over COVID, it's um, it's it's significant numbers, um, and clearly, you know, that trajectory is just going to carry on. So, I think it's 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 got its uses, but it's got its limitations. But it's it's here to stay, and I think you know it's 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 brilliant that ultimately you know the new Q's pathway included that, and um, it was a uh, you know it's a funded activity as well in there as as well as net, which is great. So um, because previously I think there's been you know, um, calls to include them, but ultimately no funding for, for doing it. So, you know, why, why would you do it? So I think that's, that's, that's great. So, um, but, but there will be future developments, I'm sure to me, mean that, you know, home consultations, video consultations are become uh, more mainstream, to be honest, it's the direction of travel. I, I think I agree with that. And I think one of the messages that's coming loud and clear from the questions here is anything NHS England uh, and the central team can do to put pressure on the local commissioners to really expedite digital transformation would be really welcomed. I think the other thing that goes alongside digital transformation is things like workforce transformation and both within primary care and within within hospital care. So Sarah, one of the, one of the questions that came up was, was the, was the Royal College of Ophthalmologists involved? And obviously I responded and said yes, but maybe you can talk a bit about the kind of work involved in around workforce in order to prepare for both restoration and transformation. So um, between, before um, the steering group was set up, the College of Optometrists and the Royal College of Ophthalmologists um, worked together on a joint vision for restoring and transforming eye care pathways. That's available on, on both websites. And a lot of those principles are what you see in uh, the roadmap um, that, that's been produced as, as this first part of the um, the, the restoration work but I, I think it's key that we really look at workforce. Um, we at the college um, really would like to see um, that all optometrists particularly within primary care are able to use um, you know all of their skills um, and, and um, have that have their skills recognized and valued by their secondary care colleagues uh, relied on be seen as a part of a, a multidisciplinary team um, that that co-lead pathways and and um, can 
you know, look, look at that and develop new pathways in their local area together um, right. and have that shared integrated care um, monitoring, managing, managing patients together. Um, we do need more data on workforce um, uh, across primary and secondary care, across all um, eye care professionals. Um, we, we need to know, um, you know what the current workforce looks like at the moment. Um, where are those higher qualifications? Where are they not being used? Where are the gaps? Um, perhaps where areas um, would benefit from having uh, more optometrists, for example, with higher qualifications. Um, not that higher qualifications are needed to be able to take on all of these enhanced services, but um, it, we want to make sure that, that um, they are also recognized and, and valued and used too. Um, we at the college um, would also like like to see um, better triangulation within population and patient needs so that you're looking at workforce need alongside um, what you think the demands will be for eye care going forward. Um, now, this is something we've started to talk um, to NHS England about, um, but I think uh, as a college, it's something that we're also looking at what we can do to help ensure we've got that data because without it, um, I think that um, you're not going to be able to get the full picture of what's needed and necessarily make the case for change. Peter, you wanted to come in, I think, at that point. Yeah, I did. And and sort of really putting my sort of day job hat on a little bit. Um, Sarah, Zoe, Giles and, and numerous other people who are involved with the professional bodies and all sorts of, have sort of discussed this. And I think that one of the big things that we've, we've all, be, it's become clear that we're all very aligned on is higher qualifications have a place and can be very useful. What we mustn't do is undersell the existing skills of the optometric workforce. We have a very highly skilled, highly trained, regulated, and in most cases working in very sort of technologically advanced settings. And it would be a travesty if we don't use this process to make certain that we utilize those existing skills and processes. And as much as I'm supportive of the higher qualifications, we really do need to focus on what optometrists can already do as well and really, really make use of that sort of skill set. And, and Zoe, that was certainly one of the core aims of cues, wasn't it? When we when we for, when we were when we were formulating that, it was about core competency. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, to to, to participate in in cues, you need to have the core skill. And we've got to remember, you know, that you know we've we've had seen some data around the number of episodes in hospital eye services and ophthalmology. But, you know, there's probably about twenty million. Um, appointments in primary care and optical practice each year. What, what we need to do is optimize every single one of those appointments so that the clinician that's delivering the care is able to use the full, the, the full expertise, the full capability, so their equipment that's available to them, the skills that are available to them, before we start thinking about actually making a referral on a referral you know we sometimes you know i'm thinking about this the passing of the baton you know we very readily pass the baton and make a referral to hospital eye service we've got to be really careful do as much as we can and this is where all the referral filtering comes in using our core competency before we um, hand over the baton to somebody with a higher qualification and um, cues does bring in that opportunity to network with primary care colleagues that do help have higher qualifications or do have a different piece of equipment as well so it makes full use of primary care and i and i think by full use of primary care i think it's really important that when we're talking about clinician we're talking about all clinicians all clinicians. It's optometrists it's do's it's clo's in fact it's the whole primary care team that a patient act come, comes into contact with um right i'm very aware that this debate could go on all night actually um, and if we're, if we're going to keep this to time, we're going to have to really call this as the last question. For those that have submitted questions, and I've tried to ask general questions to draw in as many of the themes as I can, we do have them all recorded. So what we'll do is we'll work through these and we'll come up with a document that we can present back, probably at the end of the whole conference that picks up the theme. So don't feel that your questions have been, have been ignored because they haven't. So really, the last question I want to ask, and I want to ask each and every one of you this, given that we are looking at a four-year programme, what do we want restoration and transformation to look like in four years? So I'm going to start, someone's got to go first. So I'm going to start with Claire, and then we'll work, we'll work around. So, so Claire. I think picking up on some of the points that have been made before around... Um, 
really, really seeing the uh, core competencies of optometrists really being utilised. Um, so having 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 the right pathways, having you know, using technology, um, so, so that optometrists are working to to their to their optimum uh, level. Also having opportunities to be extending their skills if that is what they choose to do. Um, and, and working as part of that multidisciplinary team. So, so, so my aspiration would be that we, we really develop eye care systems where it becomes normal for us to work really collectively with our colleagues, uh, our secondary care colleagues um, and other, 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 other colleagues within that system. And it just becomes business as usual. We, we're, we're just working collectively. Doesn't matter where, where we're based. We're just getting on with the job together. Giles. Uh, I think my, mine's, um, mine's very simple. The end metric for me is all about patience and uh, it's all about re reducing, you know, avoidable sight harm, loss, you know, and waiting lists. And um, we, we need to work as, as, as a system to, uh, to, to fix that, whether it's um, two-way connectivity, it's, um, uh, you know, uh, however we want to do it in terms of the pathways, but it's, it's, it's got to be focused around the patient. You know, that's that's what I think we all want as clinicians. We all we all want less less avoidable sight loss and less patient harm, to be honest, and shorter waiting lists. And uh, that's going to be very difficult with um, with with an aging population. So that would be that would be brilliant outcome. So and Sarah. Well, similar to Giles, I think um, ultimately we want all patients to have equitable access to good quality eye care, the best outcomes possible for, for them as individuals. Um, and that we avoid all those unnecessary visits um, or long waits um, to see uh, the hospital eye service when they could be managed um, closer to home by, by primary care optometrists, um, you know, unless they have a, you know, a high risk or, or um, urgent condition. And I, I would like to see uh, primary care optometrists, DOs, CLOs, um, seen as equal valued part of a multidisciplinary team so that we have fully integrated eye care um, and, you know, potentially that idea of, of first contact practitioners. So um, all, all patients see their primary care optometrist first um, and um, that that individual will manage that patient unless there's something that has to be seen within the hospital eye service. And, and that, you know, we, we can get that fully funded um, and, and be able to then to, to grow and learn from, from all of the different pathways that will be um, trialled across, across England um, so, so that we can ensure that wherever you live, you're going to experience the best care in the best way for, for your circumstance. And Peter. So I think I'm going to say broadly what everybody else has said, but it is, it's, it's about access for patients. It's about... Um, optometrists using their skills. Um, it's about optometrists also being funded for their skills. And then it's also, as, as Sarah's just said, about bringing in the other parts of the profession as well. So as optometry moves forward and steps into more of the sort of traditional secondary care roles, it's important we embrace our DO colleagues and make certain that they also get to step into some of the things that may have previously been optometrist roles, because that's the only way this will work. If we're doing other things, then, then, we, then it has to work across all of it. But it needs to be that there aren't these regional variations. It can't be that if you're sat on the crossroads of five areas, you've got five different ways of doing things. It needs to be the patient walks in, they get the same service wherever, our skills are utilised and they're, and they're paid for appropriately. Zoe? Difficult coming last, isn't it? No, no. <laughs> How mean? Um, do you know what? I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't disagree with anything that's just been said. Um, for me, it's about, you know, the clinician not being constrained. We are constrained in too many ways by the contract, by the lack of connectivity. We, we don't want to do more for patients. So let's just remove all of that. And then we're not going to have these headlines going forward, are we, that um, how many patients each month um, could have had sight and you know this sort of this this is picking up on Giles's point the the avoidable sight loss you know that 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 we need to um make that a thing of a past and finally Karis I mean I think I'm gonna I'll, I'll slightly slightly praise the, the the same question to you to say 
I think we're hearing a real consistency here from across the, the panel members, but also I'm seeing exactly the same consistency in the questions. It, in your role, this is, I'm assuming, I'm assuming something you can, you can take right, right back to the centre of the programme. It is, and um, today we're on our all staff briefing, and um, and I will share something that Amanda Pritchard talked about, which is that we want decisions made as local to patients as possible. And I think for, for us in the national programme, we need to be able to sort of show some transparency around sort of kind of the data and, and the, the where services are to be able to then inform them and help decision makers locally to make those decisions. Um, and we'll go on and talk about, you know, what I call distributed leaders. And it's about, for me, how we kind of create that as a very genuine thing across the system. And I would also be about how we can make patients leaders in the work, you know, that we are doing with them to provide care to them and with them. Um, and, you know, I'm a patient myself and I think, you know, it's being able to give sort of transparent and, um, you know, if we can be really utilising some of that sort of power around um, artificial intelligence and sort of kind of that data mining to help people sort of see some of the kind of like, what else is going on? Um, and, and certainly in like for cancer, there's been lots of sort of evidence around being able to really pin down about sort of what's happening for people and how we can help them sort of make choices, particularly around where, where their treatment and if there are different options, but you know, what and how could we be doing that in a really effective way? Um, which is a very broad answer, but I think it's about really, you know, how do we enable everybody to enable those patients to be getting the care that they need? Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a mirror, um, and I think that's nationally for me. It's about really us focusing on the things that are sort of. Claire and I talk about the dominoes. What are the things that are the big that, that we need to shift? Because actually, it will create its own sort of domino effect. Um, and I think for us nationally, it's kind of focusing rather than kind of doing a thousand things. It's really focusing in on what will be some of the sort of key things that we need to do and wrestle with big wicked problems and being able to kind of resolve those. Splendid. So on that note, um, it falls to me to thank the panel. I think that was really, really good. And as I said, I think we could have gone on quite a lot longer if, if, if we had the time. So thank you to all of you. Um, and to hand back now to Karis and Claire for the final part of this evening's session. And I guess to expand on what we've just talked about. So, so over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. I presume we are all now being able to see that. So Claire and I are going to sort of take you through um, really about how and what we're doing to support implementation um, and, and, and what's that sort of future next steps. Um, and we're going to finish with a video and then I'm going to hand uh, back over to Richard. So this is where hopefully the... So um, I'm not going to go back through the infographic, but it really does weigh sort of a uh, four mile sort of reach map about what and, and how we are doing. So um, very much we're focusing on uh, the pathway implementation, but I'm gonna share with you just a bit of a summary of work that we've been doing in the digital and transformation uh, space for, for commissioning as well. So um, we have uh, worked with, or, or rather our primary care uh, sort of uh, commissioning team nationally uh, have been working with NHS X and um, they have rapidly rolled out NHS Mail, um, and certainly that number of uh, practices that have been able to be registered has, has exponentially increased, increased, and that means that actually there is um, a safe and uh, encrypted way to be able to kind of pass clinical information uh, and clinical uh, specific uh, sort of uh, kind of patient record identifiable information in, in a really secure way across the and expanding that NHS Mail network. We have been uh, talking about uh, upscaling and uh, remote and uh, diagnostic clinics and very much the uh, toolkits. Uh, there's a series of toolkits on the IK Hub. And again, that's giving some really granular information to help people identify what and how uh, it can support them about implementing, uh, in particular, uh, remote uh, appointments and clinics. 
We have then been working quite extensively with NHSX um, and uh, last Friday there was something called a dynamic procurement system uh, which was launched and, and an open invitation to suppliers and uh, what NHSX is wanting to do is to identify suppliers um, who the NHS can then go and procure off uh, the dynamic purchasing uh, procurement system uh, for electronic eye care referral management solutions and that's about setting some new standards uh, for the NHS and uh, it will allow uh, NHS commissioners to actually have a streamlined process uh, to be able to go and uh, procure and, and it's a much shorter uh, timetable. So that's a very sort of immediate thing that we have done and we will have to wait to see uh, which suppliers actually apply uh, to go on to that and that just uh, will sort of implement sort of just before Christmas. Um, NHSX has also been doing some work to identify what digital solutions are, are out in the market and um, they have been doing a number of playbooks and they are creating what, an ophthalmology playbook and that's really a sort of place to start to sort of go to understand uh, problems that uh, systems had and what digital solutions they put in place. Um, so that will be published uh, early December. And then within the commissioning space, uh, we have been working with Get It Right First Time. Um, so we have expanded their data uh, collection process to uh, include some additional commissioning questions because that will help us to start to uh, inform and use some information uh, because we're starting a sort of what we're calling a deep dive uh, into commissioning uh, root causes. Um, and then again, on the eye care hub, we've been developing some commissioning FAQ documents uh, and those will be go on to the eye care uh, hub in the next couple of weeks. And um, Claire has been leading with Emma Munro, who uh, we introduced you to earlier, um, some sort of what we're calling commissioning deep dive. And that's really to start to think through. And we are doing some uh, work with some systems who, who want to focus in on this um, and producing a landscape audit as well. So out of this work, I think we are wanting to work with uh, different systems. And I think at some point, Claire, I'm going to hand over to you. And I can't remember if it's this slide or the next. <clears throat> Well, we could just do half a slide each, couldn't we? Um, so if I, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so, so what we recognise is that so we're working with different systems, and you know these different systems are in different places. So uh, we, this is an infographic that I really like. It's sort of the innovation curve around you know, um, sort of t taking on innovation that that. The, the, there's always those innovators who are you know the first ones to go with with something new and then and then the, the rest of the population is is split um to the early adopters the early majority the late majority and the laggards that are always the last and always want to see what everybody else has done first um and so actually if we were thinking about all the systems and you know, we have so much diversity of, of, of where the different systems are at. So we're working with these different systems um, and, and, and they, they can be in different, different places, but we're really keen to be able to um, and understand differences and, and, and take learning and share learning across, across systems. Um, so if I can have the next slide, please. So as part of that work, um, the regions have identified a number of systems and asked us to work with them. And, and those systems really are at different places on that <clears throat> innovation scale. So it's not all of the early, all of the early adopters or, <clears throat> or the laggards we've got, a re it will be a real mix. So, so very much the approach, that's what's going, this is what's going to happen sort of between, between now and March, very much in terms of looking at where are they now, um, looking at a strategy and an action plan, and then looking at how to how to solve, how to how to look at, you know, what, what are the blockers, what are the things that are happening, um, that are stopping them uh, moving forward with some of the parts of the of the roadmap. Some of that will be about advice. It will be signposting, peer learning. Some of it will be national input, um, and we know, you know, and it will be about linking to exemplar sites, um, because going back to some of what we said before. This isn't just about something coming from the top. This is about peer-to-peer -peer learning. This is about us all taking responsibility um, to, 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 to share and learn and, and move together. Very keen to demonstrate and celebrate success um, and look at what we can measure, um, really looking at system leadership. And, and, and as part of the process, we'll be refining and strengthening the roadmap and resources. So that's going to be in 
intensely support for a few systems, but really keen to, to, um, to not just be looking at a few. If I can have the next slide, please. Our other, um, oh, no, I'm gonna go back to this one. So sorry, I forgot about this slide. Um, so, so this was just to share some of the information that we're getting in the baseline review. So although this is something that has been produced for, for those, um, for those, those few systems that want to be supported, there's no reason why this can't be um, can't be something that actually we just share with you. And this could be something that starts some local conversations right across the board. So really, really looking at you know what is it that you've got in place? Um, what are the metrics? Um, what systems have you got around risk? And just really going through systematically to understand what you know, what have you actually got at the moment? If I could have the next slide, please, Karis. And and then and then looking at what what elements are already being delivered, like the remote consultations, um, the, the, the diagnostics, the PIFU and the advice and guidance, and really just starting off to, to do that, that sort of basic baseline audit of, of what's what's happening, so that then further work can be done to try and understand well what you know what what is it that's going to be most helpful? What is it that, that they need help with? And and that is what we will do with those systems. So if I could have the next slide, please. But also a real aspiration to empower the many, that that actually there is so much that goes on from that bottom up um, and I'm so aware of that with the audience that, that that we have here I was an LOC chair um, in the past and I'm so aware of those local and those regional conversations that happen and and the way that um, the, the way that as LOCs you're connecting and sharing good practice so so some of the work that that we've been doing we've done um, we've connected with some of the LEHN chairs at a national meeting, working with GIFT. Um, Karis has already mentioned that there's some, some of the big pieces of work that they're doing in London and the East. Um, very much working with our NHS England and Improvement regional teams because they're the people who are actually out, um, you know, out in those regions supporting local, local systems. Um, Blogs, vlogs, frequently asked questions, clinic surgeries. Those are the, the plans that we have to, to just be putting resources out there um, so that there are lots of conversations that can be started. Um, hopefully um, there will be lots of resources that you can access through the eye care hub. Um, there are wider NHS programs that we, we've been able to support as well. Some of the work around the community diagnostic hubs, some of the ICS developments. But it's really about how do we how do we how do we harness that collective um, leverage from an, from national, regional, and system? How can we how can we use everything that we've got to scale up the support? To, to implement that eye care roadmap that what we really desire to do is to, to, to empower all of us. So I'm going to pass over to Karis for her last bit. So I am conscious, Richard, of time. So um, maybe this is something that um, locks you and sort of maybe, you know, you can continue the conversation, but it will be really sort of good to, to identify, you know, are there ideas that people have got that are on this uh, meeting and webinar tonight that, um, that think that there are some ways that we could kind of do things at a national, regional or sort of local. So um, we were going to use the chat, but I'm just conscious that, that we need to finish. Um, so I think I would say that there are five things that all of us can do. And I think it, we can be part of that, are empowering the many. Um, and I would say, you can do things, I can do things, and then we can do things. Um, and so I think there is something for me about that call to action of, you know, what can each of us commit to doing? Um, and how can we become like super connectors and start conversations? So I've set out five things that I would like to leave with you as that challenge, which is 
sign up to the eye care hub and um, again uh, i'm sure richard you'll be able to sort of share that link um go and digest the roadmap it is on there in its draft form um and then we will be able to through Loxley to send out um, once we've got the link uh, when it's on the nhs england and improvement website um the baseline assessment is in these slides but again we can share that with Loxley to share out um how and what can you do to to really create strong partnerships uh, in your local systems um but there's also decisions to make um, and so really that's that's my call to action of all of us here is, is about what and how we can take forward each of those elements um, and I'm going to finish with a video um, because I think what we want to do and what we need to do is step further out of our individual boxes um, and Liz is going to set a uh, sort of a three minute video um, which is really it's an advert for a Danish TV um, it's not the NHS, but it's it talks about all that we share. Um, and I'm going to leave that for us to be able to kind of have as a really poignant point. So I'm going to stop sharing, Liz, and I will hand over to you. It's easy to put people in boxes. There's us and there's them. The high earners and those just getting by. Those we trust, and those we try to avoid. There's the new Danes, and those who've always been here. The people from the countryside, and those who've never seen a cow. The religious, and the self-confident. There are those we share something with, and those we don't share anything with. Welcome. Jeg kommer til at stille jer nogle spørgsmål i dag. Nogle af dem kan godt være lidt personlige, men jeg håber, I vil svare ærligt på dem. Hvem herinde i rummet var klassens klovn? And then suddenly, there's us. We who believe in life after death. We who've seen UFOs. And all of us who love to dance. We who've been bullied. bullied others. And then there's us, the lucky ones who've had sex this past week. <laughs> we who are broken hearted. We who are madly in love. We who feel lonely. Sexual. And we who acknowledge the courage of others. We who have found the meaning of life. And we who have saved lives. And then there's all of us who just love Denmark. So maybe there's more that brings us together than we think. TV2 Denmark. All that we share. Thank you, um, and thank you to everybody who has who has spoken tonight and presented. I think it's been a, a really, really enlightening and useful presentation. No matter how much anybody knew prior to, to coming tonight, I think for me the. The takeaway thing theme really i suppose that video says it actually that we're all we're, we're all able to to input into this it doesn't matter whether or not you're sitting on steering groups as, as some of us are or whether or not um you're not you're part of an oc or you're part of a practice or, or whatever we all have the opportunity to be able to feed into this process and whilst 
whilst there are some inherent risks within this, there are also there's also a lot of opportunity. I think there's a lot of scope for us to be able to try to shape what we're doing. But the important thing is that we keep pushing it forward. We keep driving it forward. We, we keep trying to, to, to stretch ourselves to do more. And if we do that, my call to our NHS um, colleagues is support us. Um, I, th I think the one of the key messages I've heard both from the questions, actually from some of the presentations and, and from the panel is we're talking about systems. Actually, I think what we really need to talk about is a system. It doesn't matter if that system is then duplicated a number of times, as long as it's basically the same. Um, we, 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 need, we need some kind of single approach to how we solve this problem. And I think we've said this for a number of years. We are, and we are in a position where I know that we can deliver that in primary care. We just need, we need, we need the support to be able to push the local commissioners to do what I think nationally NHS England would like us to do. And that's, that's kind of my, my, my plea to our, to our, to our NHS colleagues. So with that, um, we've, we've run a minute over, which, um, which I think was, is, is pretty going. You'll see that a feedback survey has just come up on the screen. I'd really appreciate it if people could complete that. Um, it'd be really useful for us and it's really useful for us planning going forward. Um, I'd like to thank the sponsor Optus again um, for, for their input. That's, that's been really, really much appreciated. It's, it's quite difficult to sponsor a virtual event, but I'm very pleased that they, that they came forward to do that. Um, and I'd also like to, to say this was really, this is the first session of the four evening sessions we're doing, plus the, the WOPEC peer discussions. Please, if you've not booked on any of the other sessions, but you want to, you still can. Um, the booking's open right up until the event, and I'd encourage as many people to come to as many events as possible. Similarly, there are some slots available on the peer group discussions, but they're filling quite fast. So if people want to be involved in those, then do go and book, because once we've filled those sessions, we haven't got the facility to put any more on. So it, that's, that, that is the one area that's limited. So thank you to everybody thank you to all of you for um, participating and, and asking questions and, and getting involved virtually as I said we've recorded the questions we will answer them and we will feed back so don't feel your questions have been wasted and I really look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow night where we will be discussing something different we'll be discussing the COVID response but I hope we get the same level of interaction and debate so thank you all very very much